Thanks. OK, so, um, uh, so in the first lecture, we didn't really talk about braids at all. Um, in the last lecture, essentially the only thing we did was uh, introduce, just at the very end, introduce um, a categorical braid group action. And I'll remind you of the definitions and the de of that action in a moment. Uh, so the goal of today's lecture is to try to convince you that, uh, that this particular action and more generally braid group actions are useful for studying the braid group, useful for answering group theoretic questions about the group. Um, a <clears throat> maybe a, a, a kind of a perspective point that's worth emphasizing here, I mean, categorical actions of groups, braid groups in particular, are not new. Um, these things have been around for quite some time, certainly in, in representation theory and algebraic geometry. But usually, you know, if you have, if you have a, um, a braid group, maybe think of the type A braid group, acting on <laughs> some sort of category, maybe a triangulated category. Traditionally, um, in most of the examples, what people were really interested in was this category. Like the, Prominent example is if studying category O or something like that. And then one might care about the braid group action in so much as it's an organizing object for studying the category. But in much of the literature where braid group actions appear, the real object of interest is the category. It's the thing with the rich structure that you want to understand. Um, so the emphasis is more on the category and less on the group. That uh, changes to some degree when you start doing not homology. That's an example where categorical actions, you care more a little bit about the group. Um, here, I'm really trying to take that uh, from the completely opposite point of view and say maybe this is the object we care about and okay, we're going to construct some category, modules over a zigzag algebra or whatever, but what we really care about is the group. Um, and that emphasis, I think, is uh, kind of uh, understudied to some degree. Okay. So let me remind you where we are. So uh, we have a graph, I think it's the Dinkin diagram of your uh, uh, symmetric Katsumudi algebra, and associated to it, there's a braid group. Now, the graph encodes the presentation of the group. This is the presentation. The generator, the group generators commute when there's no edge between the vertices, and they braid when there's an edge between the vertices. Um, and because it will come up later, let me also um, point out that the same presentation could also um, be thought of as a presentation of a monoid rather than a group. So you could just, you could present a monoid by, in exactly the same way. So what I mean by present a monoid here is, when we present a group, we formally throw in inverses and anything that's implied by group axioms. So you don't do that here. When you're presenting a monoid, you don't throw in inverses. Uh, you, just, you just throw in whatever is implied by these relations and the associativity of multiplication in the monoid. Uh, of course, there is a map. Um, of course, there's a map of, uh, of monoids from here to here, taking sigma i to sigma i. This is a map of monoids. And uh, it's, it's not, uh, not at all obvious, um, but in fact, this map of monoids is injective. This, this is a theorem of, uh, the injectivity of this is a theorem of, um, um, of Deligne. In, uh, in type ADE, you know, in other words, whenever the, the vial group is finite, and uh, uh, Paris more generally. Okay. Um, so what that means is that if you, so, so, so that means that I can talk about positive braids here unambiguously as um, the sub-monoid here generated by these positive generators or the image of this monoid in here. There's no difference between the two. Okay. All right, so let me remind you of the categorical action that we are studying. So we, from this graph gamma, we defined the zigzag algebra, which was a, uh, we took, first we took the doubled quiver, so we turned that graph, that unoriented graph, into a quiver by doubling it. And then we quotiented by some relations. That was the zigzag algebra. And uh, then uh, we were going to study, the, the category we're interested in is something like 
category of modules over the zigzag algebra. So there were indecomposable projective left modules, P sub i, one for each vertex. P sub i as a vector space is just spanned by paths which end at vertex i. There was a right module, things would start at vertex i. And there was these uh, bimodules over the zigzag algebra, these temporally lead bimodules, which we wrote down. Okay, now the, uh, the braid group action, define complexes of bimodules. I'm just abusively going to denote them sigma i. Well, there's a map of There's a map of bimodules, there's a canonical map of bimodules from here to here. Uh, and what, why is that? Well, what was this? This is just, so this is the tensor product paths ending at i, paths starting at i, and if you concatenate the paths, then you just get an element of the zigzag algebra. Um, so that's a map of a gamma, a gamma bimodules. And uh, so we just take the cone of that map, that's, that we get a complex of, a gamma, A gamma bimodules. And just to fix conventions, by convention, I'm putting the zigzag algebra in cohomological degree zero, and this term here in cohomological degree minus one. Um, okay, so this is a complex of bimodules. And uh, in fact, there's a uh, complex there's also another complex you can write down. There's actually an essentially unique up to scalar map of bimodules the other way, going from A gamma to a shift of this temporally lead bimodule UI. So I'm, uh, I'm not going to define that map for you, but um, <laughs> but you can, if you play around, you can work it out. It's, uh, it's, it's a nice exercise to work out. Uh, write down a map of A gamma, A gamma bimodules from the zigzag algebra itself to uh, UI. If you play around, there's uh, essentially no choice in what you could write down. Um, okay, so again, this is in homological degree zero, this is in homological degree one. So there are these chain complexes of bimodules. Now, of course, what's nice about bimodules is that you can tensor them. So then, theorem. So this is um, <laughs> Govano Seidel, Mukia and Zimmerman. Um, let's say where Fano Kavano. Um, uh, basically, for in all of these cases, is in exactly this language. Um, in in the homotopy category of graded uh, a gamma a gamma bi modules. There are isomorphisms So in the homotopy category, up to homotopy, these complexes of bimodules satisfy the braid relation. In particular, um, so this, this, by the way, concatenation here just means tensor product of complexes of bimodules. So sigma i, sigma j here means I take this complex of bimodules, I tensor over the zigzag algebra with the complex for sigma j, 
that chain the chain complex of bimodules you get there is isomorphic in the homotopy category to, to this guy, et cetera. And, and the proof is, uh, and the proof is an explicit computation, which I'm, I'm not going to do now, but um, it's, it's not a conceptual proof, really. It's a, just a, um, you just do it. Uh, so in particular, uh, we could consider, now we could also consider any, so any bounded, but we're here we're dealing with bounded complex, um, complex of bimodules gives a functor from the category of the, the homotopy category of left modules to the homotopy category of left modules. So let's say you have a chain complex of left modules. And, uh, and you have a complex of bimodules. Let me call the complex of bimodules B for a second. And this is also a uh, chain complex of left modules. So these complexes of bimodules we could also interpret as functors from left module category to left module category. So we get, so, um, so, so as endofunctors of, now I'll just, Call it script T. So this is the homotopy category of graded projective left A gamma modules. This was the triangulated category we introduced last time. Um, so as endofunctors here, these braids satisfy what? Well. Let's think about the functor that A gamma defines. I mean, tensoring with A gamma is the identity functor on the category of left modules. So we get as functors, now instead of uh, sigma i star, I'll just write sigma i inverse, because it really is the inverse. And braid relations. We get an action of the braid group on the triangular category T by, by auto equivalences. And um, so the rest of today's talk is to try to convince you that this is an interesting thing to study if you're interested in studying the structure of the braid group. Okay. So any, uh, any questions about, about the, the definition of this action before, uh, before we go on? So what's the relevance of a triangular construction? Um, in examples, one finds these categories happen to have a triangular construction and part of it is relevant, or do you have an interpretation for all of the axioms? Um, the, uh, well, here it's really just that uh, these relations, so for these relations, first of all, they don't, have, they don't hold in the abelian category of bimodules. They only hold in the homotopy category. And so the structure that remains when you pass to the homotopy category is triangulated. However, it turns out that the triangulated, this, we'll see this a little bit, some of the structure here that comes from being a triangulated category turns out to be quite relevant for studying, um, studying the braid group. So it's not that so much that there's an interpretation of the axioms of a triangulated category, but notions like T-structures and stability conditions are very compatible with, uh, which are very much things about triangulated categories, are, uh, are nicely compatible with this action. Okay. Um, any other questions or comments?
Say again? Yes. <laughs> the zigzag algebra of type AN. Um, uh, so this, uh, the point is in type A, this, uh, this guy shows up independently uh, in the parabolic category O for GLN and also in the Fukai category of the punctured disk. Maybe that's worth, uh, yeah, here's a remark. Um, what Matt is talking about? Okay, yeah, so that, uh, yeah, those are two important comments to, uh, to make, so let me write them down. Okay, so some remarks. First, uh, type A. Uh, in type A, there's a close relationship between this linear action of the brain group on the homotopy category of modules over the zigzag algebra. And of course in this case, in type A, this braid group is the Artin braid group, the end strand braid group, very much a topological object. And the, uh, the appearance of this braid group as the mapping class group of the disk with punctures. Uh, of course, the, that's one appearance of the braid group is as the mapping class group of this, uh, this disk. And this, uh, this is in the sort of foundational paper of kovanov seidel So what, so just briefly, what do they do? So there's two different actions that one could think about. And there's a, uh, curves in the disk. If I take isotopy, an isotopy class of curves in the disk, you know, if I take a curve like this, and I take a mapping class, and I hit it, I get a new curve. So this is a, so in type A, you have these two, two actions, one very topological in flavor and the other uh, linear. And these two things are what kovanov seidel explain is uh, that you can, you can go between these things. In particular, if you take a, um, that to each, to each element here, to each, each appropriate, ad each admissible curve in the disk, whatever that means, th there is um, an associated complex. In here, and this assignment intertwines the break group actions on both sides. Um, so morally, what this is uh, morally what this is saying is that this is uh, this is something like a model of something like a Fukai category of the disk. I don't know what the precise version of the Fukai category is that makes that true, but that's um, uh, that's what they're doing. So, <coughs> and uh, actually, as a corollary of this construction, I'll come back to this. But corollary of this construction is. Um, and this is Kalanov Seidel. In type A, the action of the braid group on this category is faithful. <coughs> That's uh, that the faithfulness of the action here is a, is a consequence of the essentially the faithfulness of the action here. I mean, the action on curves here is faithful up to applicate up to powers of the full twist. Okay, so this is uh, type A specific, but uh, you know one could give a whole course about this sort of stuff. And uh, the, this Kovanov Seidel paper, this is the I think this is jams uh, around 2001. Um, it's, a, it's a good paper to look at. Okay, uh, that's the first remark. Uh, 
Maybe second remark. Uh, what does this, this action have to do with, uh, with Zergle bimodules? I mean, that's the other grade group action that has already appeared prominently in the, um, in the lectures. Uh, and this, uh, so of course, we're, uh, the katz moody vial groups we're talking about are cock trigger groups. So there's a theory of Zergel bimodules associated to them, and there's Rukia complexes and a braid group action. And the, the, um, the, the Zergel bimodules themselves categorify the Hecke algebra. Our bimodules categorify the true temporally Lieb algebra. And the true temporally Lieb algebra is a quotient of the Hecke algebra. So categorically, that's what's going on here. This, this, uh, this the category of bimodules over the zigzag algebra is a quotient category of the category of observable bimodules. So, so the, there's, I mean, essentially, I'll put, I'll put this a little bit in quotes because uh, there's some, um, uh, some base change as well that you have to put in, but, uh, but morally, the, the Zergo bimodules to the, the zigzag bimodules is a quotient. What you, what you kill in this quotient is you kill the, the kajdan lustig basis element. You kill the Zergo bimodule corresponding to a long element in a rank two parabolic. For those who think about those things. Um, so you get rid of some Zergo bimodules when you have here. When you, when you go here. And this, is, this categorifies the quotient map from the Hecke algebra to the temporally Lieb algebra. And um, more, what, that means in, uh, what that means at a kind of concrete level is that this is a much, much easier category to work with because the Hom spaces are smaller. It also means that you can prove theorems about the action here if you prove them here. So for example, um, the known, as far as I know, all the known results about faithfulness of categorical actions of braid groups on Zergel bimodules use proofs of faithfulness of actions here and pull them back. Okay. <coughs> okay, so um, let's, second remark. Um, uh, maybe, and third remark, just uh, what we have defined so far is, uh, is what might be called a weak action of the braid group on this category. Meaning that if you have two, we, we've, um, if you have some braids, beta one and beta two, and you look at the associated functors, that, that functor is isomorphic to the functor that you might assign to the product beta one, beta two, but we have not specified that isomorphism. And we haven't checked any kind of compatibility of those isomorphisms. So one might in principle be interested in, in stronger actions where you strictify this action. Um, you, can, you can strictify everything in this example. So one can make, upgrade this to a strong action um, where you specify isomorphisms like this improves some compatibility, but uh, I certainly haven't done that in the setup. Um, so we're only gonna care about this action um, at, the, at the weak level. Okay. In other words, said another way, uh, we have a group, what we've produced is a group homomorphism from the braid group to isomorphism classes of autoequivalences. Uh, so, I mean, this sort of should be this sort of uh, 
you should uh, specify isomorphisms that give you commutative diagrams like this for any three elements in the group. Yeah, but the, the issue is that I've only specified functors for the Artin generators. So for example, the braid relation, there's an isomorphism you print. I said they're isomorphic, but I didn't specify it. Okay, um, so let me give you a couple computations just to get a sense of uh, what's going on here. Um, so, for, so the next remark is some uh, just example computations. I'm just going to act, I'm just going to say what you do if, what, what you get when you act on a braid generator on the indecomposable projective modules themselves. Okay, so if you take the braid generator sigma i and you act on the projective module pi, which again you're thinking of, I'm thinking of as a complex where the, this chain group is supported in cohomological degree zero. Um, then what you get is um, so you get a shift of pi, but it's shifted. So sigma i shifts pi, but it shifts it in homological degree and in the internal grading, like this. Um, if you act on sigma i of pj, what you get is this complex. And this is, this ha this is when uh, i and j are neighbors. And when i and j are not neighbors, then sigma i doesn't do anything to pj. It's just pj. Okay? So this computation is a, is a nice exercise. It's if you have never done computations like this and would like to see it done, I'm happy to um, talk to people about. Um, so these computations are just to motivate the next remark, which is um, about the growth and deep group. So again, let me just define what um, Define what that is. So let's um, let me just define this to be the so I'm going to take the ZQQ inverse module spanned by 
Um, So I have, I'll just take a basis vector, one for each isomorphism class of projective module, and then uh, the relations that we'll set us, that we quotient by are just a class of P plus Q is class of P through X sum class of Q, and um, a class of P shifted by one in internal grading is Q times the class of P. These brackets here is just notation in the growth and group. This is not the triangulated shift. This is not, this is just the growth and group of the additive category of projective modules. And, uh, but now you can, if you have a bounded complex of graded projective modules, you can also define a vector in here. So if, if M is a complex, then then you just define the, the class of M to be the Euler characteristic. So if the chain groups are projective modules MI, then you just define them. This is also, if this complex is bounded, then this is also in here. <coughs> now the action, the braid group action on the triangulated category, on the homotopy category of modules, descends to a braid group action on the growth and group. So we get a braid group action on, on the growth and group. And uh, let's just write down what it is from these computations. How does the, how does the braid generator act on the class of PI? So in the growth and group, the class of PI goes to minus Q squared class of PI. Um, the class of PJ, when I and J are neighbors, it goes to um, the class of PJ minus Q times the class of PI. And when, uh, when I and J are not neighbors, the class of PJ it's sent to itself. So for those of you who've thought about these um, things before, you know, in other words, this has given us, so, so the classes of the PI form a basis of this as a free ZQQ inverse module, and this computations have worked out the matrices for the braid generators in, um, in that basis. And so what you see from this is, so this is, this is, this is a known representation of the braid group. This is the, this is called the reduced, Borel representation of the braid group. So if you remember the gradings and pass to the growth into group, what you've categorified is the Borel representation. And uh, the important point to keep in mind here, and this is, Except in small rank, this representation is not faithful. A notorious open problem is whether or not this representation is faithful for the four strand braid group. That's still open. But um, so in other words, so the, the, even in type A, you know, once you get to the five strand braid group, this representation is not faithful. But by the Kovanov Seidel theorem, the action on the category is faithful in type A. So philosophically, this, what this suggests is that there's information about the group which is captured categorically that you don't see classically at the growth and group. Um, so that's part of the motivation to, to think carefully about the extra structure in the category is you definitely lose information when you pass through the growth and group. Okay. Um, okay, so that's, uh, if for remarks, so now <coughs> okay, so maybe just to emphasize it, so a conjecture which um, 
the moment I don't know how to prove, um, is that uh, no matter which type you're in, the action of the braid group on the homotopy category of projective modules is, um, is faithful. So this is, I'll say a little bit about this uh, tomorrow, but most, if not all, of the basic open questions about these groups will follow once you know this. So this, I think, uh, this conjecture is uh, important structurally. It's a kind of, um, morally, it's important for the same way that the Tietz theorem about the faithfulness of the vial group action on the root lattice is important. Um, that's, that fact is something you use a lot when you study vial groups, so one would like to uh, do similar things for break groups. Um, but this is known in cases, uh, special cases, but it's not known in general. Yes? No, no. I'll give you another proof uh, now. Um, yeah, um, but, uh, but indeed, the fact that the type A proof, I mean, that, that proof really uses something special about type A. It uses the fact that the break group is this mapping class group. So there's not any obvious way to generalize that argument. Yes? Uh, in finite type, uh, can you use uh, the Gartz structure? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's, that's more or less the, what I'm gonna, uh, gonna explain. That's right. So, the, the, I mean, it's not the only example, cases where this is known, but the, uh, but one class where this is known is um, when gamma is ADE, so, so the vial group is finite, then the action of uh, the Bray group here is faithful. Um, this is uh, due to, so although they only considered it in, uh, uh, they, they, Rookie and Zimmerman only considered this in, uh, in, in type A2, which is pretty small, but their proof is, uh, is wonderful. So, uh, I mean, it's not doing them service to say that they didn't do this, but they, so they did this in type A2. And Kovanov Seidel and type AN, and then uh, Chris Brov and Hugh Thomas in um, type ADE. Uh, and I think there have been, oh, there have been other people who've worked on this in some other types. Um, so this is not exhaustive, but, uh, but since I am going to explain it in finite type, this is. And, uh, and as Christian points out, this proof. This proof exploits a relationship between this action and Garside theory. You, you, the proof I'm going to um, give you here is very similar to the Broad Thomas proof, but it doesn't use any Garside theory. So I'll try to explain the proof that, that uh, Owell and I worked out, which is motivated by this, but is uh, from some points of view maybe a little simpler to state. Okay. Um, So I want to explain the idea behind the proof of this theorem, or at least one proof of it.
Okay, so uh, to explain the proof, uh, we need to explain a little bit about how to think about um, how to think about chain complexes of projective modules of the homotopy. Because we're interested in chain complexes or graded projective modules in the homotopy category. Now, the beautiful thing about the zigzag algebra, in contrast to the many other braid group actions one might think about, is that the morphism spaces are very small. There's just not that much, there's just not very many um, morphisms in the category of projective modules. So for instance, if I take a module PI, what kind of morphisms are there from this guy to any graded shift of PI? Well, there's um, one possibility is there's well, you know, what morphisms are there from this to graded shifts of any other single projective module? Where there's the identity map from PI to PI. There's also right multiplication by the loop. There's this degree two map from PI to a shift of PI. Or there's a map from PI to any of the neighbors which, and there was a degree one map like that, x, i, j. So these are the only, up to scalars, these are the only morphisms in the category of projective modules. So a chain complex of projective modules is, the differentials are just built out out of these, are, are matrices whose entries are linear combinations of these, um, of these maps. So, <coughs> now, but now we're in the homotopy category. So in the homotopy category, sometimes you'll have two different chain complexes with different chain groups that are isomorphic in the homotopy category. And how can you tell, so what can you do, so, so, the, so if, if, um, if you have some object in the homotopy category of projective modules, there is a unique minimal representative. There's a, there's a unique, there's a unique chain complex whose chain groups have minimal rank that's homotopic to M. So this is called the minimal complex. The, and, and in the minimal complex, in any minimal complex, it's e so it's easy to tell if you have a complex whether or not it's minimal. In any minimal complex, then there are no maps like this in the differential. So if you have any chain complex of projective modules and you look at the differential, if there's ever a map like this, then there's a smaller homotopic, uh, isomor uh, smaller complex, which is isomorphic to the complex you started with in the homotopy category. The, the phrase you use is you do Gaussian elimination here and you make the complex smaller. So, so the way that one studies, so typically the way that one studies the braid group action here is to think about how a braid, how an auto equivalence is, moves the minimal complex around. So you have a minimal complex, you hit it with a braid, you get some huge complex which might not be minimal. You shrink it to the minimal complex and you see if you can see anything. Thank you. Yeah. So let's draw, I want to draw what's going on here in a picture because this will, so, so these are the sorts of, so I want to look at what a minimal complex looks like. So it's convenient if you're, uh, <coughs> you're going to draw these things. Uh, so here I'm just plotting the chain groups and the two axes. One axis is the cohomological degree and the other axis is the internal grading. So for example, 
if I, the module P1 thought of as a complex, you know, the module PI thought of as a complex in cohomological degree zero with no internal grading shift sits kind of here at the origin, right? Now, if I had a, now what about a, the complex um, PJ shifted by minus one lives here. Those guys could be connected by a map in a, you know, these two, these two guys could, um, could appear with a, a component of a differential in a chain complex. Um, and now this, you know, this PJ, now if I had PJ, um, this could be maybe PJ minus three, could sit here. There could be a loop map like that. So, or there could be a map coming in here from the I two. Well, I won't draw that one yet. So the point is, in a minimal complex, so the, the, what's nice about this picture is if you draw the, if you plot the chain groups as lattice points in this picture and you draw the differentials, in a minimal complex, none of the arrows go down. So the arrows in a minimal complex, your complex is minimal precisely when the arrows go to the right or up. So that's, so minimal complexes are those where the arrows in the differential go to the right or to the right and up, but not down. Okay? Now, <coughs> this, uh, so the category T has two very important um, subcategories. There's the complexes whose minimal complex lies up here. So you look at a complex, you look at its minimal complex, you plot the chain groups and you say, does it, if it's up here, that's, a, that's one subcategory which I'm denoting like this. And there's also those whose minimal complexes lie down here that I'm denoting like this. And there's of course the complexes which lie on this line, which is the intersection of these two. So the guys on the line maybe I'll call T0. Okay. So this data, this subcategory, this subcategory, the intersection is, um, has a name. This is what's called a T structure. Um, I'll say more about what that means uh, next time when we're talking about stability conditions. Basically, this is a way to chop up objects in your category. The point is every object in the category is uniquely, uh, is, is every object in the category can be constructed as the cone of a morphism from uh, something here to something here. Say again? There's no tau. Oh. Yeah, my curly T's, there's no curly T. It's all the same, it's just T. There's maybe capital T and lower T. Okay, um, now there's an important thing about this here, which is part of the axiom of the T structure, which is there, the homs between these categories are quite constrained. The more, there are only morphisms this way. If you have an object in here, it could have more, it could emit a morphism to an object here. But there are no morphisms from things up here to things this way. There are no morphisms from things that down here to things below. Okay? So, so that's, so this is a T structure of the category. This T structure is important because, so what's important about this T structure is um, this uh, T structure is, is compatible with the braid group action in the following sense.
in what sense? Well, of course, inside the braid group, we have the positive braid monoid, positive braids, and we have the negative braids. <coughs> and um, this is sort of annoying, but negative braids preserve this category, and positive braids preserve this category. In fact, this category is the extension closure of positive braids acting on the PIs. You take positive, act on the PIs of positive braids, um, and th th then th that gives you this. So in fact, in other words, this T structure is essentially defined from the braid, can be defined from the braid group action. That, um, the fact that T structures and braid groups and compatibility of them is important, I think that idea is originally due to Bezrakovnikov, who used it in some, uh, some situations to study categories in, uh, in geometric and modular representation theory. Um, this fact was also essential in Brav Thomas's proof of faithfulness. Um, so, okay, so let's, let's use this to, um, to study the, to study the break group. So here's, um, okay, so now here's, here's a question that one might ask. Okay, let's look at, um, Let's look at a braid and so, so we have PI, the, com the, PI, the complex PI is uh, sitting here, so it's in T0. This is in, in T0. And the question I want to ask is when is beta acting on PI in say, the positive part of the T-structure or maybe the negative part of the T-structure. In other words, if you look at, if you act by the braid on PI and you look at the minimal complex, when does it live up here or when does it live down here? Okay? So here's a, so here's a proposition. Oh, let's see, is it there? Okay. So let's, let's, let's consider a positive braid. In other words, an element of the, um, an element of the positive braid monoid. So positive braids preserve the stuff down here. And if we take this positive braid and we act on PI, we get something strictly below this line. We get something strictly below here. So that's the computation of positive braids. Yeah, that's right. So I didn't, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a computation. It actually, it basically follows from the computation, the three computations I wrote on the board. But that's right, that's, uh, that's something you have to check. Then this is in this part of the T structure, if and only if the positive braid beta is beta prime sigma i, where beta prime is a shorter positive braid. In other words, if you have a positive braid, you might ask yourself, what are the, you know, there are some braid relations you might be able to do, but you should ask yourself, what are the possible positive braid generators that can appear on the right? That's a purely group theoretic question you could ask about the braid. In this representation, we can ask, well, if we take this braid and we act on PI, when do we land 
below the axis. And these two things are exactly equivalent. Sigma i is a right descent of this positive braid if and only if pi is sent to the negative t structure. So what you should think here, this is sort of analogy, to the situation with the vial group. If you have an element of the vial group, then SI is a right descent if and only if, if you act by W on the simple root alpha I, you get, um, you get a negative root. So the sort of combinatorics of reduced expressions in the vial group is controlled by which roots are sent from, po by positive, to, uh, from positive to negative. And this is uh, a somewhat analogous statement. Okay? <coughs> um, so there's uh, three minutes left. So I'm going to try to prove this. F uh, well, actually, I'm not going to. Okay. It takes about uh, three minutes to prove this, but I want to say something else instead. So um, this is. Uh, this is actually. Once you know how to compute the generators acting on generators, this is not hard to prove. Okay, um, what's the upshot? What's the upshot of this? The upshot is the action of the positive braid monoid on the triangulated category T is faithful. This is an arbitrary type. There's no assumption, this, this theorem this has no assumption on being finite type ADE. So in other words, and this was first proven, this fact was first proven by Brav Thomas. So in other words, the action here distinguishes positive braids from each other. A priori, it says nothing about arbitrary braids, um, because the statement was just about positive braids. But it, is, it distinguishes positive braids from each other. And, and there's, a nice, um, there's a nice corollary of that. There are two nice corollaries of that that I'll state, and then I'll be done for one minute. Okay. So the first corollary is um, this theorem of Deline and Paris that the monoid injects into the group. So corollary one, and this is again arbitrary. This is arbitrary gamma, the map from the braid monoid to the braid group, this is the monoid, is injective. Why? Well, how on earth do you, so this is, this, remember this makes no reference to triangulated categories or anything. This is just a question about a presentation of a monoid and presentation of a group. But to show that this map is injective, it suffices to show that this monoid injects into some group. Because the map from this into any group factors through the map to this group. So if you can show that the map from this into some group is injective, then it follows that this map is injective. But we have just produced an injective map from this monoid into some group, namely the group of autoequivalences of T up to isomorphism. So that's the first fact. And the second, corollary two, When gamma is ADE, the action of the entire group on T is faithful. Why? Well, in type ADE, any braid can be written as a positive braid times a negative braid. So if you want to distinguish 
this braid from the identity, it suffices to distinguish this positive braid from the inverse of this guy, which is also a positive braid. And that's who we've been. Okay, so this is a pause. direction is easy, that's just a computation. Right. And this direction, you have to do by induction on the, on the length of the braid. Um, and I, I'll show you, it's, I mean, it's one line, but, um, but yeah, there's something to do. You have to use the fact that there, you have to use the braid relations in the proof of this direction. Uh, y yeah. yeah. Okay. Do, you, do you know if there's a similar model for Fukaya categories of symmetric products of the function of this? Um, um, if you take, uh, if you take the zigzag algebra and you wreath it with a symmetric group, then the category modules over that also has a braid group action on it. Um, and that category has something to do with the symmetric product of the surface, but I don't exactly know. I mean, that category I think is bigger than the Fukai category of the symmetric product of the surface, but I mean, there's some, um, I think in the symplectic Kavanaugh homology story, uh, uh, something like this comes up. But I, don't, I don't have a great answer. Can I ask the same question, replacing symmetric product in the induction with configuration? For example, the configuration of two points, which uh, gives the Lorentz Biblo Kramer representation. Yes. It's could be simpler to um, Simpler to categorify the, sorry. The, Do you think there could be uh, such model for this? For the Lorentz Kramer Biglow yeah, representation? Yeah, but I don't know exactly what to tell you. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I have thought about this a little bit. Um, it's, rela it's probably related to some of this Verma module categorification story that uh, has been, uh, been developed. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I don't know how to see the Lawrence Kramer Bigelow representation directly from zigzag algebra and then you do something. Um, 